Um, a couple of announcements before we get to our panel is just next month, permanent C and slash annual business meeting. And we still need some people who are interested in being the president and the secretary for a two-year term. So let that just sit and think about that while we talk about all of these amazing topics tonight. So we've got the why it's in the room, Cameron and Danielle or Danny. What do we go by? Anything. Danny. Okay. We've got Lucy, case manager from Burley County, and Zoe, who's the daughter of the Wyatts. And they're going to tackle some of these tough topics, these um, just how do you, how do we navigate through some of these challenging topics and um, how do we not be terrified by some of them in some cases, right? Um, so hopefully at the end of the night, we're feeling a little bit better equipped to handle the random things that kids say, ask, or go through. Okay, I'm going to turn over the mic. Who wants to hold it first? <laughs> you know, I did just want to say for clarity sake that um, it doesn't matter how many times you go through some of these tough topics. It's no less terrifying. Every time's a new time, and it's not great every time. But with experience comes ways to get through that and to talk with the children. And uh, my wife is upset that I'm speaking. So uh, on to her. Oh. oh, we've been fostering since uh, 2014. Um, we started through Morton County Social Services, did that for about a year, and then did transition into PATH for... Yep, and treatment foster care through PATH. Um, we did that for a number of years, and over the last uh, almost year, almost year, we've been through Burley County. So uh, here's my wife. We separated them. <laughs> no, I think that he handled any dates. I will be handing or numbers. I will hand the mic back to him because he's got those locked in. Um, so yeah, no, I, the only thing I would add is just that, like that transition from like Morton, so county level to PATH was a really helpful, beautiful thing for us because I think PATH offers a huge level of education, a huge level of support, um, especially if you take advantage of all the things that they have to offer. Um, and we really needed that at that point, especially because we were taking some of the kids that you needed that extra support and needed note. I mean, I think all of us come in and we don't have any idea what we're doing. And when you have path is that extra support, it helps a lot. So, and now we've been through a lot and know a lot. And so I think we were able to transition away from path just because we didn't quite need that level of support and everything else anymore. No, we came in with the viewpoint. Well, <laughs> we initially came in, um, we were going to do one foster child and potentially two if it was a sibling group, but that was going to be our cap. Um, and we wanted younger kids, zero to six. Yeah, no. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny. I think it was you that had said that you originally were going to take I don't know what your age group was, but now you have like a nine-year-old or whatever. So I guess nine is, and I feel like that's a lot of our stories where you like originally set your age group in a certain area and then you take another kiddo because they need it and then you expand. For the online audience. So because you made a transition from one age group to the next, talk about what caused you to continue to take then teens after that point, maybe some of the joys or the fulfillment that you got out of that age range. And what? And we have 18 plus today. Yep. So I think that it, there's been just every single time that we transition up or transition into something else, you just experience things differently. Um, you could not pay us enough money right now. You could not do enough things for either of us to say yes to an infant at this point. There would be never a time in our lives where we would say yes to that again. Um, multiple reasons. I think for us, 
that infant range is really, really hard just because they're supposed to be making those bonds with their biological family. And when you're doing that, it's so hard to make those bonds and keep those bonds with their biological family and they end up bonding to you. And then when you're supposed to reunify home and all, I mean, it's just, it's a lot that infant age group and that two to three year old age group is really, really hard for that. Um, something that we really realized with the older um, elementary on up, um, I, we really started to fall into that age group pretty quickly after we started fostering, just because you can talk, you can explain things. You can say, Hey, you know, in an age appropriate way, this is what's going on with mommy and daddy right now. These are the things we're going to try and do to help. These are the things that like, this is my role. This is caseworkers role. These are the things like you can explain some of that better. And it's easier for them to understand that you're not coming in and taking over for mommy and daddy. You're not coming in and um, severing any kind of connection. You're just an added support. And so their brains can digest that in a different light than like, say, a four and below, even five and below. It's really, really hard. So I think we fell into that pretty early on. Um, the transition up to path was because we fell into it in a pile of fire. Um, and quickly realized, cause we fell into it with, um, a group of boys that had really high, high needs. Um, I don't know how much you guys want to know, but like needs that were like aggression towards us at a high level, um, suicidal pieces, all of those kind of things. And so. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one of those, uh, children had significant, uh, rad or reactive attachment disorder that definitely, um, played an integral part into us moving up to the treatment level of care and getting that extra support. Yeah. And I think with that kiddo, we also needed to be able to utilize things like, um, CPI and like learning holds and learning proper times and techniques to use those holds and all of those different pieces, um, when to call to get help, when to do all of those things. And I think PATH really helped us with, I mean, that growth with being there in that mindset and being there with us. And it used to be that when you called PATH, like you got your worker Monday through Friday. And so your worker knew everything that was going on. They knew what was going on in the home. They knew everything that was happening. And that was really, really helpful for us because if it happens at nine o'clock at night, lots of times you call on call and you're like, what do I do? And they're like, I don't know this kid. What do we do? And so that, that was really helpful for us. And then all the extra trainings and stuff. And then, I mean, transitioning into teens, some of that was our teen was growing. And so <laughs> she started introducing us more and more into the teen world and the teen realm of everything. Um, and then we just, I just, I really, really, truly enjoy that relationship that you can build with teens that you can't always build with the younger age group. And so I think we both really enjoyed that where it's, I mean, there's a certain aspect to it that is like a friendship. That's obviously I'm not my kid's like best friend, but I am their friend. I am their best friend. Like I am, you still have that connection base at that higher level, which I really, really enjoy. Um, you can go out and do things that you would do with your girlfriends. Like you can go out and do things with your kids that, are fun. You can go get nails done or you can go and, you know, like all of those kind of things. And so, yeah, just really fell in love with that really fell in love with like the communication that can be done, the relationship building that can be done. And we stayed here. So yeah, that was a long way to answer the question, but. Okay. So can you share some practical tips on maybe preparing your home for older elementary kids? Like say someone in the room gets a call and they're like, all right, I'm going to say yes. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to say yes. Um, are there some practical ways that you prep your home differently? Or if there's some different um, challenging behaviors that you know are coming in, are there some good tips that maybe someone would know that you don't think about with younger kids? So the first thing that I would say is something, again, that PATH does really, really well, and I think county is transitioning into, and that is a really good meeting ahead of time with all the supports that that kid has. Because most of the time when you get a teen, not all the time, especially county, but most of the time when you're getting a teen in, they have a story, 
county has information, there's information, somebody has information. Um, lots of times they already have workers as far as a therapist or any like other resources. So that, that initial meeting is really important. I would say, um, we've had both ways where a teen shows up on our door because we get a phone call saying they blew out. We really need something. Can you help us? <clears throat> uh -huh. They also know well enough at this point to have Lucy call me if they would like for me to say yes. So, um, but yeah, like, I think that that's one of my biggest things is as prepared as you can be in those moments. And if you can't have a big full on team meeting, it's, sitting down with the caseworker or having a really ironclad conversation with whoever's calling you saying, what are all of the risks? What is everything? Like what, tell me what you know. And then it's kind of safety planning inside of your family for any of those risks. So for instance, if the risk is running, which is a very common one for almost all of the teens that we've come across, um, what kind of things are in place for that? And Zoe can talk a little bit on this if she feels comfortable with it, but like, for instance, like having safe places to run, what can be a safe place, like trying to establish those things really early on. So that way they know if they need to escape for a period of time, if they need to, even like most of the teens coming in, know our ironclad rule is you have 10 minutes. If I don't know where you're at, if your location is gone, if whatever, you have 10 minutes and then I'm calling the cops, but you have 10 minutes to go take a breather, do what you need to do. And then you come back before I'm going to call or take any next steps some of those things. So they, they have an idea of some of that right away. And I mean, every kid is different. One kid might need three minutes. One kid might need, and I mean, we do a lot of, you can call me as long as you have your phone with you and you call me in 10 minutes and you're FaceTiming me. And I see, I can see where you're at. You don't have to say anything to me. You don't have to process with me. You just need to make contact with me. So I know that you're safe and then we'll restart that timer. And then you can kind of talk to me again. I think something that we've really experienced with teens is there's such a sense of control and power that they feel is lacking in their lives. And I say that they feel there really is a lack of power and control, especially when you talk about foster care. Um, and you add in a case manager that is just controlling my life. Um, and so I think just trying to find any strategies you can to help them. Um, so yeah, I think it's that safety planning, whether it's suicidal pieces, asking, okay, what do you want? What is the safety plan as of right now for those suicidal pieces? Like at what point in time do I call? At what point in time do you want me to seek this? Or so those kind of pieces, I think we feel a lot more comfortable when we can have those conversations and those calls ahead of time. So that way we can get a lot of that lined up and you're not just sitting there going, oh my gosh, it happened. Now what, what do I do? What do you, what do they want? That I think is, I mean, as far as having things, uh, you can have board games, you can have, I mean, we have nail stuff and we have, I mean, I have built-in teens everywhere at this point in almost all of the age groups. So they almost always have a friend coming in that can relate or can do whatever, but I think it's electronic devices is the biggest thing. Do they have some way to reach their outside world? So something where they can still not feel completely cut off from their outside friend group or their, I mean, that's one of the biggest things that we've seen as far as, and then we always go, a lot of girls want like certain products. And I mean, we don't always go and get them the most expensive of any, like, but we'll go and get them some things that are familiar to them. So, but a lot, I mean, with like little kids, I feel like it's a lot more gravitated towards like toys and having things that they can play with or like their favorite, like cartoon character. And with teens, I feel like it's way more, can you connect into their outside world? If they have a way to connect into their outside world, almost always everything else is fine. They don't care if they're sleeping on a blanket that's 10 years old or anything else. They just care that they can connect with their outside world. So maybe talk a little bit about navigating the they don't have a device or device limitations or monitoring or anything like that that's useful to just know or understand. And should I hand it to you? I'll give you a question. Yep. No, that's fine. She's got this. So. What? <laughs> And Cameron can speak to this pretty well too. Cameron's kind of our lockdown person as far as locking down devices. So a lot of what we do is we talk to case managers ahead of time and say, tell me exactly who is okay and how can they communicate. I also 
I'm pretty good at weaseling my way into friend groups because if your friend likes me, they're a whole lot you know, more likely to tell me that you ran and where you ran to than if they don't like me. So I'll usually do everything I can to try and like inch my way into a lot of that. Um, bridging those connections, bridging those gaps. I like to try to be a part of that connection building. So whether it's with biological family and that's where we have a struggle, I'm going to supervise those phone calls or volunteer to do those visits or volunteer to like be a part of that, be connected in with the biological family, be connected in with the friends, be connected in with whoever it is, whether it's a boyfriend or whoever. I guess what we have found is if you just blanket, take those people out, teens find a way almost always. And so we have had better luck with, you can talk to them, but it's on speakerphone and I'm sitting right here. So let's talk to them. I'm excited. I want to meet them. Like, tell me about this person. She will even attend their homecoming dances. I do. Yep. I like, I'll chaperone, I'll chaperone dances. I'll like, I do, we do all of the things as far as, I mean, those pieces where we really just try to like bridge those connections. I, I would rather them find a way with me sitting next to them where I can guide it. So that's kind of what we have really, like we give back small portions. So we'll lock down the phone and here are the contacts you have. And then we're going to start with that. So here are those contacts that are approved or that have been approved through social services. These are the ones that they won't supervise. So anytime you want to call or contact that person, we just need to supervise it. So you can talk to them whenever you want. Just make sure mom is there and we'll start talking to them and rebuilding that relationship and trying to get it healthy. Um, I think that's where we found most success is just having those conversations. If there are safety concerns, we know about what the safety concerns are. And then we just try and find ways, creative ways as a team to still have those connections, but you get an inserted mom into those connections. And then obviously locking down if there's like pornography challenges or there's um, like sex trafficking where they're talking to people where we're worried about sex trafficking or those kind of things. It's just really trying to like come up with safety plans where we're not completely shutting something off or something, shutting something down. We're creatively trying to find ways where they can still have some connection with these people. And then it's also like they get flooded with like conversations from us and with caseworker and with therapist and with everybody about, okay, how are we doing this safely? Cause you can have this, but what, what does that look like safe? What are our two family rules? Safe and loved. And if you're safe and you're loved, I'm, I'm happy. Like we can navigate through the rest of it, but if it's breaching safety or it's breaching whether or not you're loved, we need to come back to the table and try and find another solution. So do you have anything additional to add to that? What's worked with us in locking down devices or with like when there is a lockdown device, you've experienced lockdown devices before? What do you mean? Do you have anything like on like what, what helps with like if kids come in and they have a device or they have safety risks or anything like that? where they shouldn't be on a device, things that have helped you, things that don't help you. Like when we completely locked down your device and said you have nothing at all, I think it makes your brain panic. And then you really, really struggle where if we can give it back to her in, in doses, that connection is really, really important. Yeah, so um, I feel, so like like she said, if you're just like, if if you just take the phone away like and lock it all down and they have no longer have that connection with the people outside of the family it makes it a lot harder for um them to like I, I don't want to say be successful but it, it just something in your mind changes and you don't um yeah you you don't have things like you don't have as many things to work towards or look forward to whereas if you if even if you like take that away but you have a goal set to if you do this or however or like in however long you can have this back then there's something that you can look forward to and um work towards so yeah I don't know <laughs> Okay, as a foster parent or case manager, 
and we think like, what are some good considerations in talking about or parenting some of these really hard topics? And this is like, I'm going to throw some at you and let you respond to maybe a bunch of them at one, like one at a time. Okay. But things that are things not to say, things to say, approaches, expectations, building trust, safety, like kind of addressing some of those things or when to escalate it. So first topic, sex, go Lucy. No, I'm just joking. Well, I mean, we've had yeah, a line. We, okay. yes, we well, do. I'll let Lucy go. Oh, thank you guys. Let they live Lucy with you. She's doing a great job. Well, thank you. Well, I would say very open communication. Um, I've had some crazy stories where I just got a kid on my caseload and I get a phone call from a really upset parent that found my kiddo in their child's bed at 6 a.m. And they didn't know about it. Neither did we. That was great. Right. Um, so just open communication between the foster parent, the case manager and the kiddo. Um, we can't stop them from having sex or liking boys or girls, et cetera, but just the open communication education. Um, if they're female, definitely like talk about birth control and what it can do. And just that communication piece, like don't shun them for what they did, but if you keep it open and like, oh, well, let's meet this boy, bring him to the house. Let's have this open communication. You'd rather have them be in your living room openly seeing you than sneaking out at night. Yeah, I would echo that um, as a parent's perspective. I mean, she's a caseworker and she doesn't have these kids coming in and out of your house and all those different pieces um, where when it is your house, you're like, who is this person that you just snuck in at three in the morning? Well, I was asleep and had no say on whether or not this person was in my home where all of my other children sleep and where I sleep and all of these other pieces. Um, so it's a lot of that communication too. So it's like safety planning all around. So safety planning on what's safe inside of my house, like what's safe is sneaking out for you safe. Nope, not safe. Um, it's a lot of those kind of things. We are very much so an open family when it comes to having conversations about sex, about drug usage, about anything. We have a lot of really, really open conversations about all of that. So we, it's probably like, yeah, I wish they would stop talking to me about it. Um, but I think that that's such a huge thing. We um, really early on as foster parents um, ended up attending a CAC group for sexual behaviors and um, things of that nature. And I really think that that group helped us a lot with um, knowing what was sexually appropriate and what wasn't sexually appropriate. And so knowing better how to guide based off of that, like where, how do we, like, when is it appropriate to add in certain safety measures? What is age appropriate? I mean, like if you have, you know, a four-year-old that likes to strip down naked and do the windmill, like some of that can be age appropriate and we just need to guide them and be like, Hey, we can't do that in the middle of dance. Like we need to make sure that we keep our clothes on because it makes other people feel really, really uncomfortable. And those are private parts. So I think that like, it's having all of the age appropriate conversations as they age. Um, sex happens. I think having the conversation with them that's open and honest is always the best way forward with any of these things. Um, not shaming, but definitely pointing out all of the educational pieces, having really in-depth conversations with them about the educational pieces. We had a kiddo that came in and we were like, let's talk about prep. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about how these people treat you. Let's talk about... I don't know if you guys know what a sneaky link is, but I found out what a sneaky link was. And like, that's like what? you. Yeah. Oh yeah. From the one that wanted to move out yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, a sneaky link is, uh huh. Is like the, they, they don't want other people to know about you. So like you guys are like closed door relationships. And I'm like, how can that ever feel good? Like, how is that, the, how does that make you feel? And like, just trying to have the child sit down and actually sit and register. And I mean, that child has grown so much from those days to now she can sit there and be like, I demand better for myself. I know I deserve better. I will not be with people in that realm. I, but I mean, that didn't happen overnight. 
that was like a series of conversations, a series of like, what does this look like? How do we talk through this? And I mean, I don't think, I think one of the biggest things with teens is if they feel shunned or they feel unsafe to come to you with those, like those topics or to have those conversations with you, it's a lot harder than for them to get to that place of, okay, so yeah, that probably wasn't safe or that was damaging, you know, who I was as a person from these areas. So, I mean, I think the best way through that is with that open and them knowing it's open communication with everybody. So that's, that's great to, you know, we can continue to talk about open communication. And uh, when that fails, I recommend ring cameras and door alarms. Because you know what? And window alarms. Because, you know, sometimes children aren't always going to be 100% honest and 100% forthright with you. And then, you know, and then you know when those sneaky links are coming over because they're setting off your alarms. So, um, you know, and that's really just the the biggest aspect. And I agree with everything that she said and a lot of that, that uh, communication is key. And then when the communication does fail in certain aspects, because children aren't perfect and they're never going to be perfect. And uh, you just have that extra fallback for making sure everyone is safe. So, oh, we got a question in the audience. So, so the question in the audience is for a child with reactive attachment disorder, how do you open those channels of communication for someone that's resistant to that? We're going to get into marriage counseling later. Um, so I think that that is one of reactive attachment is one of the hardest. I mean, so first and foremost, just you need to hear that one, you're not alone. And two, you are battling one of the hardest diagnosis that anybody can hand out. Like reactive attachment is a really, really, really hard one. So everything you are doing, you need to pat yourself on the back for, give yourself an internal hug because you can try 17 million things. And lots of times it, it, it just takes a long, long time to reform that, to re grasp that. The best thing that I can give for advice on reactive attachment is having a well-rounded team. I want to say this in the kindest, most loving way I can say this, but potentially a therapist of your own that you can go to that can remind you that you're doing a really good job and that what you're battling is a really hard thing. Um, I, They need a really good therapist. Um, the thing that I think we have found is most helpful in bonding in those moments is lots of times words don't go through very well. And so we have seen physical touch is probably the biggest helping factor inside of those realms. So we do a lot of rocking with our teens, which sounds really ridiculous. And I swear it's not against their will, um, but they will crawl into my lap and I will just hold and rock them. And I rock and I rub their shoulders and I, because their brains can't compute it in those moments with words. If anything, that's just overstimulation continuing with that reactive mind that's on fire. And so if I pull them in and hug them, it can trigger portions in their brain of I am safe. I, I am still loved, I am wanted, and it can trigger in ways that it doesn't matter what words or how you said it or whether or not you did the right thing. It, it just, we have found that that is one of the biggest strategies that helps. We have a kiddo in our home right now that we are now doing um, cuddle breaks. So I don't know if any of you guys have experienced this with therapists, but there's always like, what do you want your magic word to be to end the argument? And you just say that magic word and it can be like fiddlestick. And then, you know, the, the argument is ended and everybody comes back to the table. It never works. Like, I think I've heard that from 17 million different therapists and it's just never helped because in that moment, they don't care about a magic word. They care about winning the argument and you better shut like shut up and listen to me and just give me back my phone. And if you give me back my phone, everything else will be fine, but give me back my phone. I'm not giving you back your phone. So 
I think in those moments, we, we started using cuddle break and we can both say, is it time for a cuddle break? Like she can initiate a cuddle break. I can initiate a cuddle break. Either of us can initiate. And then the other one always gets to set up. Yes, I do need or want a cuddle break. Can I have 10 minutes? I want to re-regulate myself first and then can we do it? Or sometimes we'll just do it right then. And it's actually working out now, even so when she's not dysregulated, like screaming at me, but just dysregulated, like her emotions are high or her um, anxiety is high. She'll come to me and just say, mom, I need a cuddle break. And it's enough for me to go, okay, like that's our, our keyword that like, this is important right now. And she will come and she will lay down and she will cuddle in and I just hold her in those moments. And it's enough to re-stabilize her. Um, you know, take a break, go calm down. We tried all of those things. None of those things were able to get into the brain the same way is just saying, hey, can we take a cuddle break, which pulls her in. Like she then, she has stuff that um, really triggers abandonment. And so everything that I say in those moments triggers that you don't want me or you're not listening to me or you don't hear me or you don't. And like that cuddle brings in and it pulls you in and it's, I do want you come here, come to me. This is, I don't want to send you away. I don't want to not have you. I want you right here. I just want us regulated. I just want to re-regulate. So you're doing a great job. You can have my number. I'll just text you every once in a while and say, you're doing a great job in case you forgot. The shoulder pain. Oh, so where she started? Yeah, she when she first came in, she was emotionally almost non. As soon as she got emotional, she was almost completely numberable. Um, yep. <laughs> A lot of shoulder shrugging, um, a lot of I don't knows. That was basically it. Just I don't know and shoulder shrugging. I don't know was the only verbal thing that would come out of her mouth. Um, what are you feeling right now? I don't know. Um, all of the things. And now we've gotten, she can tell you exactly what she's feeling now. And she will. Um, and we're in something that I've noticed is like we're in those baby stages with her of figuring out emotional regulation and of identifying what she's feeling. And, you know, I think it's hard with teens because you expect it to be there. You're looking at them and you're like, why can't you do this? Like a normal teen could do this. Why can't you just tell me you're upset? And then we can talk through it. Why can't you just come up with another solution to this? This doesn't seem like it should be that big of a deal. But when they didn't have that or everything was shut down when they were younger, a lot of times those need to start over. So OT works for teens. It's extremely helpful in a lot of cases for teens where they're relearning some of those pieces. They're learning all of those, those strategies over again. So that's kind of where we're at. I think like five months, six months, she came in. Yep. She came in about five, six months ago. Yep. So, I mean, in my eyes, that's pretty huge growth in not a very long period of time. Yeah. Do you feel comfortable talking about sex right now? <laughs> maybe some of the other topics, yeah. Maybe the other topics will be easier for her to add into. So, okay, drugs and vaping. Okay, um, vapes are everywhere, constantly. As are drugs. Drugs are everywhere. But I, when I say like vapes are everywhere, I mean like drugs are everywhere, but I swear the number of teens that vape nowadays is way higher than the number of kids that smoked when we were all going through high school, middle school, everything. Um, I feel like it's way harder for schools to police. I feel like it's way harder for jobs to police. I feel like they are absolutely everywhere. I feel like if I lost my mind over every vape I found, I would not have, I still don't have very much of a mind left, but I would have even less than I have right now. Um, so we do a lot of pick, pick our battles where, I mean, vapes are, I find a vape, you lose the vape. Like that sucks. Don't do that. Don't bring that into my house. And then we move on. Um, drugs are a different story. 
Um, if any kind of marijuana is coming into our home, if any kind of anything else is coming into our home, um, that affects us like safety for us a lot more. So like when we talk about safe of safety of the home, that's really important to us. Um, if you're consistently bringing in drugs into our home, that's affecting my other kids. I had one kid hide her freaking carts in my five-year-old stuffed animal. So like that's a safety risk. So I think that those things, we really just try and like, like, like break apart safety risks. Once again, going back to a lot of communication, a lot of sitting down, a lot of bridging relationships with friends, a lot of that whole piece. And then it's a lot of you're making your own decisions right now. And these, we have like blanket family rules where they're like, if you keep pushing on this family rule over and over and over again, then we start talking about like higher levels of care, because these are things that not only I care about your safety, but the county cares deeply about your safety. And if we can't keep your safety at in check at a community level, then we need to start looking at a higher level of care for you so we can get that safety back in check. Um, oh my God, the schools. There's, there's a lot of drugs in the schools right now. Um, I just equated it to my caseworker this morning that I feel like it's like you're bringing them back to their like drug dealing friends and their drug, like they're using partners and their everything where like, if you're talking sobriety in the real world for adults, they're trying to avoid that friend group. They're trying to avoid those people. If they want to stay sober, they're trying to. And then when you send them back into school, there's, it's, I'm, you have this class and then they walk by your locker here. And then they, it's really, we've found it really, really challenging in that aspect. And then we sometimes get creative with like virtual schooling. We've gotten creative with like different pieces um, with the counseling office. Mandan has next step that has been helpful. Um, so just really looking into what the school district offers and working with your team, trying to think creatively, trying to find ways to get them through and get that sobriety. We have had good luck at Summit with their um, addiction program. Um, I like Ray a lot. Um, so yeah, lots of therapy, lots of counseling, lots of communication, and then having like each family is going to have their own lines with vaping. Each family is going to have their own lines with, you know, which drugs are like hard nose in their home. I mean, if you don't have a five-year-old, maybe then bringing in a cart isn't as big of a deal to your family as it would be to our family. Um, maybe that's a much bigger deal because you're in sobriety yourself. And so then bring, I mean, like every family has their own pieces that they're all going to have as, you know, hard rules. And it's just finding what those are and making sure the teen understands what they are, why they're there, and then communicating with your caseworker. Also what to add is we like Danny and I are struggling right now with a kiddo that we have in our home that struggling a lot with her addiction pieces of it and we just have communication with her of so why do you want to use what's your triggers like why are you using do you honestly feel like you have problems or do you like using with your friends and other than this child we've been pretty successful if there are other kiddos that they're able to communicate the reasons why well my friends do it well let's talk about the friendship let's see what you know whatever um and when we feel like it's been at a certain level you know we talk about the addiction pieces and the education with summit or other providers, but I would just say that open communication with them and try to figure out like, what's the reason why I think is the best place to start. Yes. All of that. What about you, my dear? <laughs> Addiction would be a really good job. You struggled with bringing what reason why? Yeah, so I struggle with nicotine. I don't struggle as much with alcohol or, um, like, marijuana or other drugs. It's mostly just nicotine. Um, I, I mean, I struggle a lot with, like, stealing it, um, trying to get it from other resources, like friends, um, um, Honestly, the thing that's helped me the most right now to not be taking nicotine when I find it 
or have access to it um is probably just focusing on what like like how is that going to damage the relationship that I have with other people like is that going to damage the trust that I have with my parents is that going to damage um me being able to hang out with these friends in the future is that going to like what is this going to damage in my life if I'm going to be going and using these things and so just focusing on not damaging more relationships or things in my life um, and just focusing on repairing those things because I don't need nicotine to survive. Like, I can survive without it. It's not a need in my life. And so just, yeah, just focusing on repairing things with my family, I guess. Yeah. That was beautiful. <laughs> okay, how about um self-harming behaviors? Hmm. Yep. Um Yeah. So Yeah, I'm not scared of them at all anymore. So hopefully I can try and help you with that. Um, so I think one of the biggest things is knowledge base. So if you get an opportunity to like be around it or hear from others that have been through it or, you know, trying a kiddo that has some of that and being like, yes, I can. I, I've accomplished this. I, you know, feel like I can manage that. Um, I feel like once once you kind of get into the realm of it, it's no longer as scary. Um, I think for me, the reason that it doesn't feel so scary is I know what to do. So if I have a kid that self-harmed and posted all over social media that they just had self-harmed, um, I think one of those pieces is like, okay, what do you do with self-harm? Okay, why did you self-harm? Was this because you didn't want to be alive anymore? So kind of asking those questions first, like where are you at with suicide? We do a lot of zero to five scales. We do zero to five scales all over our house. So it is each individual kid has their own scales that we're working on. So like Zoe's zero to five scale would have nicotine on it. Um, she wouldn't have other drugs on it. She would have zero to five. How much do you want to use right now? And she would say, and there is no consequence for anything. If they're being honest and open and just communicating, it's just letting us know where they're at with all of those pieces. Um, we do zero to five self-harm. We do zero to five suicidal. We do um, zero to five um, other usage. So like we have other kids that struggle with other drugs. So we'll do zero to five on that. Um, and then I almost always ask the question, have you had the opportunity to use today? Just because I've seen that it opens up the conversation. It also opens up the ability for me to be like, it was there and you made a different choice. I'm so freaking proud of you right now. Like you fought that today. That's amazing. Um, it also gives us kind of those it gives us that ability to then, I'm not going to take away that friendship. I'm not going to come in and say, oh, you managed that appropriately, but now you can't see them anymore because I know that they have, but I'm going to like have my spidey sense go on when you're going to hang out with that person. Now, uh, maybe I'm going to be like watching for signs of usage when you come home the next time, or I'm going to be just like being more cautious of like what's going on inside of each of those relationships. Um, So as far as like, the self-harm, our knowledge base has really taken us in a, you focus way more on, okay, go get yourself cleaned up. Um, are you ready to process like those feelings? If yes, then let's sit and process like what happened, why? A lot of times what we've seen with self-harm is it's not, there's it's separate from suicidal. So what we've seen very, very um, predominantly is it stops the big feelings inside. Big feelings were way too big. It is something that I can input into my body to make those big feelings calm down. Um, it What we have seen is really, really helpful is when we don't shame, when we don't um, over-acknowledge it, it just becomes part of the conversation. So it's not an oh my gosh moment. We're not like going, 
oh, honey, what were you thinking? Why would you do this? It's way more. I mean, my first response almost always is we got to get this cleaned up. Do you want help with this? Or do you want to take care of that yourself? And then it's okay. It, when you're ready to talk about it, let's talk about it. And then it's just like problem solving with all of your team. So with caseworker, with everybody, and almost always like, I guess I don't want to speak for you guys, but it's not even really an on-call call for me. Like at this point, I can send you an email and just let you know that it happened. And then we can talk about it the next day. Um, as long as safety is all, we have safety stabilized, the conversation has happened. Um, and then lots of times, initially, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to open up about why or anything else. And then they get into the habit of opening up and we can find other solutions. And what we found, even with um, our one that just moved in was using doing that a lot as a coping skill is that we're slowly phasing that out. So even when she does self-harm at this point, it's really, really small. It's it's not as big. It's not as, and so it's, it's a lot more manageable at that level. Um, and she's finding other strategies. Um, I did want to add into this, you know, just kind of in the beginning parts of this conversation that it is one, a conversation that you're having and in a lot of different venues and schools and other things that self-harm is almost sensationalized where it's, it's blown up into this, you know, almost euphoric thing um, for children, for other, for teens. And when you are having those conversations with the kids that are doing this, that are self-harming, it's important to remember that it's a maladapted coping skill, you know, and this is something that they've either seen or experienced with others that they are bringing into their own lives. And one of our most effective, I think, means of communication about this and phasing this out as a coping skill is recognizing that that's what it is. And then as you are going on through these baby steps in communication, making sure that teen is you know, instituting other coping strategies into their lives so that eventually that will be then phased out. <laughs> yeah, so not necessarily these two, but I do have a foster home, um, path treatment home in Fargo where one of our kiddos does struggle with self-harming quite a bit um, along with going after some foster parents when they're upset um so at that point like their rule in their house is you know they lock up their knives their prescription drugs and whatnot but not every foster home does it I would say based on the kiddo um I don't think we have that concern if the kiddo's in your home but I mean I have had kids where that is a common concern for the family so they do take safety precautions for that um and it it can definitely help. Something that we have found, we'll go back to the very beginning, where if a teen wants to do something, they find a way. Um, so, I mean, I think it can be a really good, like, preventative sometimes, so they don't have access all the time. But I've had kids steal razor blades from somebody, like a razor that they're using to shave their legs, and they'll steal it from somebody else's house and bring it home. I mean, lots of times you can lock up your entire house or you can do all of these different things. But if you're not having those open communications, those conversations with them, you can keep locking up and keep trying and keep doing um, meds. I think especially are a really good thing to lock up when we talk about overdoses and all of that, having that, that stop so that their brain knows it's not just easily accessible and they have to find another plan or find another way to get that adds one more layer to them not going forward with something. Um, but I think that they really like self-harm. Now this would be completely different if you had a kiddo that was coming after you with a knife, like we've had that as well in that I'm guessing you maybe have had that as well too. Yeah. I think we could probably pass stories pretty well. Yep. Um, but I think in those situations, it's a lot, it's a lot different. Now you have safety risks all over the place that you're trying to. And a lot of times if kiddo can't get that under control, they need to go to a higher level of care. Um, but that's a different than like the self-harm. And I think a lot of it also is if somebody is self-harming to the point where they're trying to commit suicide, that's a completely different realm too. Like how deep are these cuts? How are we worried about them bleeding out? Or is this like smaller superficial pieces where this is a maladaptive coping mechanism, but for the most part, their physical health is going to be okay. I think that's very different than if we're looking at 
really high level self-harm to where they are trying to commit suicide or they're gashing so big that they have big, you know, gaping wounds that you have to take them in and get cleaned up and get stitches for and those kind of things. So I think that it kind of just depends on, um, we have one kiddo that self-harms with scratching or want, I mean, using an eraser and like, you know, that kind of things or like burns. Some of those things I feel like aren't as high as what they can be. Suicide is a completely different ball game. I think that that ball game, you safety plan and you strategize completely differently. Um, well, it is still a maladapt coping mechanism. It is extremely dangerous, obviously. And you take it a lot more seriously. Um, we always believe our kids, whether they're, it's being used as a, you know, ploy to get out of something or anything else blanket, we're going to believe you. And then we're going to go get a psyche valve. So, I mean, I think that it's all of those pieces that are all like wrapped up into it. And my kids know what to expect. Are you comfortable talking about this topic or are you not comfortable talking about this topic? Okay. Can I share with them that you've been down this path before? I just did. So glad you said, yeah. Um, so can I show your diagnosis? Zoe has borderline personality disorder. Um, I don't know how much you guys under like know that one, but it's a really hard one. Um, feelings go zero to 9 million really, really quickly. Um, we take things out on the people we love the most. Um, and the suicidal pieces are very big inside of that diagnosis and the self-harm is very big inside of that diagnosis. So, um, this is something that Zoe struggled with since what age do you think? 11 maybe so I mean and for me that's really young to be 11 years old and thinking about not wanting to be on this planet anymore um so we have been safety planning for a really long time um I think that these are all pieces that they need to be set up around these aren't consequences these are pieces that are keeping you safe I won't take Zoe into the ER if she's going to be like I absolutely am not going and I'm not going to tell them. I mean, the number of teens that I know will go in and then they'll say, oh, I wasn't suicidal or I'm not suicidal because they don't want to go to psych. Like, we don't play that game. Almost all of my kids, like, they know this isn't a consequence and I will take you home on a safety plan as long as you have gotten back to that place. You're being honest. We can appropriately safety plan. We can appropriately do everything that we can do and you're ready to come home. Um, and so that's, I think that those are the biggest things are, you're asking those questions and then you're differentiating in between all those things. If you have a kid that's brand new and just all of a sudden feeling suicidal and doesn't know what to do with those feelings, we go into psych and we usually try and figure what that, what that is. Now, majority of our kids that come in have been feeling this way for a while. These aren't brand new. They've been dealing with this for a long period of time. So then at that point it's okay, what can we do inside of the home to safety plan this? What can we do inside of the home to keep you safe, to make sure that you're going to be okay? And those range for each and every child. I mean, there's been times that I'm going as far as pulling absolutely everything out of your room because I know you stash things. And so guess what? You've got a blanket and your mattress and these check with your caseworker over first, obviously with all safety planning, all safety planning goes through them. But like, there's been times where, and that's like a extreme, like way over here. Um, and then there's times where it's just, okay, we're going to, our almost consistent one is Kate, okay, we're on 10 minute checks right now. And that's even if they haven't told me, but I know that they're probably feeling that way. We're just doing 10 minute checks and I'm opening the door. I'm seeing if you're okay. I'm like testing the water. Oh, you still want to say cuss words at me. I'm going to reshut the door and then I'm going to come back later. And we just keep doing, doing safety checks lots of times until they fall asleep. And then we try again in the morning. Um, sleep resets the brain pretty well from what we've experienced. And so lots of times in the morning, they're not going to, they they don't feel quite as big in that. Um, and everything is going to be different depending on the diagnosis you have. If you have somebody with borderline, they may feel that like way right in that moment because they're explosive in that moment. And then if they can get a break or to come out of that, they're going to do better. If you're dealing with somebody with bipolar disorder, they may be still down in that hole and they need help 
and treatments and med changes and different things to try and pull them out. So it's, it's everything is just going to be different for every child that you're working with and lean into your team, lean into your team. Majority of the caseworkers have experience. And if they don't, their supervisors do. And so they can reach out to them. Um, contact other foster parents. If you're struggling with this, put something in the group. Uh, say, hey, who struggled with this? Can I meet up with coffee? Can I go and like do some of those things so you're not feeling so alone? So you do, you can do this with somebody else that's done this before because we all started somewhere. We all went into this being blind and having no idea what to do. So try and find somebody else that has been through it. Yeah, so stuff that like, what what does help when you're feeling that way? What doesn't help? Um, I would say the biggest thing that I feel like helps is just knowing that you're not alone and that that your parents are going to be there for you no matter what happens. Um, just also like knowing that like they're not going to like, like if you get sent to psych, you're not going to be like you're going to come back home. Knowing that like if you get sent somewhere because you need help, you're going to come back home. Because a lot, I feel like a lot of kids have those like abandonment pieces where they feel like they're going to be like abandoned and that they're not going to be able to go back. And just being reassured that you're going to go back home is really, really helpful. Um, and just knowing that you're safe, you're loved, that like if you're feeling suicidal, you're not going to get consequences because you're feeling suicidal. They just need to help you. Like know that even if you're going to, like if you're being honest, like you're just, we're just going to try to help. So, yeah. That was beautiful. Again. That's a number. All right. So that, that's a number. I get that one. Um, we have 10, 10 in the home at the moment. We do have one that is placed in a bed at our home, but is, uh, currently at DBGR. So, uh, yes, we do have 10 in the home. We have six adopted, two biological and two fosters with one currently not in the home. So 10, 10 children. Yep. Starting at, uh, twin three-year-old boys soon to be four. I wouldn't recommend that for anybody they they are cute but also destructive and have opposite personalities it's great um uh, all the way up to uh 18 uh to be 19 in january yeah and yeah. um and then we have three that aren't in the home right now but have aged out and are still a part of our families and all of that so they're still like attached into us but aren't in the home right now also as the number guys we have every other random child that danielle ever sees that um gets added into that um as well as friends and friends of friends of friends that uh, end up showing up for meals and holidays and um just on a random tuesday afternoon and uh, my son's friends from school that randomly find a dog running along and they ask if it's ours. So, you know, it's, it, our family is never endingly large. It's, it's quite overwhelming. So you can stop that anytime if you'd like. And 75% of the time they do warn me who's coming over to. Yeah. We try. <laughs> we do try. And that's, I mean, I think that our, that goes back into like the more communication that you have with your kids. A lot of them, are friends with other kids that don't have the best home life or don't have all the sports or they don't have. So our holiday tables get really, really large. I mean, I, we definitely have, and that's, I mean, I think our kids knowing that anybody is welcome to our table and every, anybody is welcome to come into the home. They can't bring drugs in, but anybody is welcome to come in. Like, I think that that helps them too when you're building those relationships and I get, TikTok sent to me about being a second mom from 
all of these different people. And I think that that really helps my teens and buy in too and feel more comfortable. So our teens. I think that's a good segue to maybe some of these other topics. So you're talking about the kids that you've already guided into adulthood and you are guiding some teens into adulthood. And those are some fun things to navigate too. So maybe talk a little bit about, I jotted down a couple, you can talk about any of these, you know, getting a job, a bank account. How are you managing like handing them cash money for all the things that teens ask for? Because I think they ask for everything. Um, and vehicles and insurance licenses, things like that, that just help transition them. We don't hand cash out. <laughs> um, we use green light, which we love a lot. It is a paid app, um, but it saves our life. Um, it is an app where they all have their own cards, but we can kind of see transactions and all of those things that are going on cash buys drugs very frequently or carts or vapes. And so we usually try to stay away from cash because most places they can use their green light card. If they're going to the vending machine at school, they can use their card. If they're going to all of these other places, they can use their card. And it's just like an easier way. We also, unless it's a pre-approve, I'm going to move this money from here to my cash app card. You better pre-approve it. Because otherwise I'm going to come and ask why you move this money to your cash up card to be able to use or to get cash out or to do all those things. So it's a lot of communication and it's trust building. So like my almost 19 year old, I don't care what she spends her money on. I don't care. And she just has a regular bank account. She has a regular like debit card. I, I helped her open the account. So I'm on there, but I don't know the last time I checked it and I'm not worried about what she's, well, she needs to budget better. But beyond that, like I'm not, yeah. I'm not super worried about all of those different pieces. Um, as far as helping them into adulthood, I would say that that is one of our biggest keys to success because the more that they see that they can be independent from me, from Lucy, from social services, and they can get these, the amount of self-worth and independence and everything that they can get from driving a car. So how do we get there? Let's talk about the steps. Let's talk about what you need to do. Let's, I want to get you there as bad, like as badly as you do. I don't want to drive your butt anywhere else. Like, let's get you that car. Let's get you all of these different pieces. Um, and each family obviously is going to have their own viewpoint on like what that looks like, how, but like having those conversations with them is huge so that they see it, they can feel it. They can, I mean, I think that that's, even for you, that's been really big on like trying to get you like stabilized at different points in time is like, what do you have to remember? What are you working for? What are you trying to accomplish? What are you like? We do goal boards a lot. So put your goals up here on this board. I don't care if it's a concert ticket to whatever, or it's this or it's this, but what are you earning your money for? What are you trying to save for? What are you trying to accomplish? Do you want to go to college? Do you want to go to welding school? Do you want like trying to get some of those things in the forefront? So when they're, you know, thinking between, am I going to use right now? Or am I not going to use right now? They have some of those things that they're working towards like connection. I cannot say enough about connection. Connection will forever and always be the opposite to all the bad things. Like Connection is the opposite of addiction. Connection is the opposite of trauma. Connection is the opposite of name anything bad coming at these kids and connection is the opposite of that. And it's not just connection into us, which is really big and really important, but it's also connection into social services, connect them with their caseworker, have them start building a relationship, text her funny memes, make fun of her a little bit, like build that rapport. Mm -hmm. when we're on our visit. So I'm going to interrupt you. So I'm going to share a little story. So we, I have a kiddo that I, when I first started social services about two and a half ish years ago, Peggy. Okay. Um, so when I first walked in the door, I got a caseload list, right? And the case load that I got, um, had some littles, had some bigs, whatnot. Um, one of them was a 16 year old who has been through like a disaster. Um, mom was never around. Dad was never around. Went to an aunt. Things were fine. She grew up, um, wanting to be somebody else who she felt comfortable with. So when I first met her, it was him at the time. Um, and he was going through a rough time. He wasn't sure what he wanted to be. The first thing he said to me is, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm gay. And I'm like, hi, what else do you want to tell me about yourself? He goes, nothing. I'm like, okay, great. No, first met the kid, knew nothing, right? So 
He was in a good foster home at the time. Everything was going good. Um, he then transitioned into he wanted to be a female. Great. So we, we supported that. Um, Danny and Cameron knew the foster parents at the time. The foster parents were very supportive. They were very supportive. We hit a lot of rough patches along the way. Um, we had a, a really, really bad suicide attempt um, related to run social media. Um, kiddo decided that he, at that time, was going to drink. Um, the foster parents did a lovely job at locking up the alcohol. However, kids are crafty, got into it, um, and slit both of his wrists at the time. Um, foster parent or foster sister found him at the time. Things were rough. Um, went to the hospital. He got glued up. We talked to a lot of uh, psychiatrists and we found a really good therapist. Um, so then he started making his transition more to a female. We parents were not in support of it. Um, we were able to finally talk to mom at that point just because we shared the first name. She thought it was kind of cool. So she kind of latched onto me real quick, um, but not very supportive of any decisions that she wanted to make. Um, they didn't agree with her mental health. They didn't agree with her name change. They didn't agree with anything. Um, so then she didn't really have a choice to come back to the home because the foster parent kind of just ended their license, went to another foster home, um, wasn't as structured for her. Um, and then she dug into more of the drugs and we got worried about the sex trafficking and whatnot with her. Um, she's very promiscuous, um, really terrified about her hanging out with older men, like over 18. Yeah, same sneaky link child. Um, at this time, she was about 17-ish. Um, went to Dakota Boys and Girls Ranch. Um, hated it, right? Um, but worked through her programming. She went to another foster home. Wasn't a lot of structure. Foster parents were really involved. Didn't really work. Foster parents, like, you need to get her out of her room done. Um, so we went back to DVGR, and we did more work. And then at that time, Danny and Cameron had an open bed. So I called them, and I said, hey, so I have this kiddo. Well, of course, went through the Pathburger first. Okay, let me rephrase that. And then I was like, hey, I have this kiddo. You might know them. And we talked about it. And we talked about their struggles. Um, went into the foster home. Still had some struggles with mental health and everything. Uh, <laughs> um, didn't want to go to school. Was failing all her classes. Like, it was, it was bad. No hopes for the future. She was just done. Well, she's now 18. <laughs> And she is doing phenomenal. She, we went through therapy quite a bit to kind of understand like why she wants to be a female um, and how to support her. It took a long, I guess, rodeo of talking to mom and uncle about like what she would like to be called and whatnot. They didn't agree with it, but they did say like, I love you. I can't call you a she, but I'll always love you. So we, definitely navigated that and we supported both of the the parent and at that time the uncle and the kiddo but she was an 18 plus program um she does still have some days where she doesn't want to be around and she leaves and she comes back hence yesterday today but she is she didn't want to drive she's got her driver's license she's got a car um she has a full-time job in something that she loves um with two promotions, graduated from high school and she's gonna start hair school and she's doing phenomenal. So she went from like nowhere to like being amazing. So I just wanna say that. So yeah. it's been a rough rodeo, but she's doing amazing. Well, and honestly, <laughs> she, she, and that's like, she, she encompassed every single one of those pieces, self-harm check, suicidal pieces, check, transgender check. I mean, there was like, yep. Pronouns. Yep. She's on hormones now. Yep. Everything. She, all of the different challenges that you face with these kids, like, and I think like you talking about the structure level too, I think that's so important when you're talking 
about teens because there's a difference between like overpowering them, but also adding structure. And I think that a lot of these teens need that structure. They need, no, we are still waking up by 7 30 because it is a school day. And I don't care that you did your GED. You're still getting up and we're getting started with our day and getting into like the life and everything going on. So I why she left yesterday and came back mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because daily chores are just not something that she should have to do. So, but that's like, I mean, those are normal teen behaviors. I will take a normal teen behavior any day, all day long. I mean, if that's what we're dealing with is you don't want to do your daily chore, I got that. Let's sit down and talk about that. Let's problem solve that. But it's it's those those higher level behaviors that that are a little bit more challenging. And also, you know, she does struggle with mental health and some suicidal ideations. Um, and she didn't feel right one day and she, we finally got her to crack that she needed to go in and get herself like looked at and medically cleared and she checked herself in and the first thing I said to you was like I'm really proud of you like you would have said nothing and stayed in the basement and we would have had to like drag it out of you just because we've known her for so long but she was able to actually talk about it and she's she's doing wonderful so she actually has a future that's what she said to us too when she first came into the 18 plus program because she battled us she wanted to do all the things and we're like, well, you can, but then you can't be an 18 plus many conversations, right? Peggy and Chelsea. So, but even just saying like at the end of the day, like you're really proud of them and they do appreciate that. And she does send me the dumbest thing sometimes, but, and then we get like prom pictures and all of that. So just having that relationship with them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that having a caseworker that's open to that is huge because I think when these teens feel like it's not just this random person running my life, you know, from the sky that has no idea who I am and what I look like and what my life is about. I think that's really hard if they don't have that relationship with their caseworker, because ultimately a lot of the things that I'm saying back to them are, we got to check with Lucy. Let's check with Lucy first. And like, once we've checked with Lucy and we have that, okay, then we can you want to dye your hair green. Okay. Let's check with Lucy first. So it's a lot easier for them to digest that and be able to be okay with that if they have that relationship. So you facilitating that and then the caseworker being open to that is huge. These are group texts. Like we do have a group yep. text with our team. Yeah. We have a group text always. Yep. Or I'll open up lots of times. I'm not going to tell them their tomfoolery to Lucy. They can tell their own tomfoolery to Lucy. So I'll just open up the chat. I'll be like, so why don't we talk to Lucy about last night? And then they come and find me and they're like, mom, I can't do this. And I'm like, oh, you're doing it. So well, you better so figure out how to do it. Yeah. Because I think it's important for them to learn how to start making those connections and talking about those things. Cause as they're getting older, those are really important things. We also do tap into Pat Nexus path for an independent living coordinator and they help with the budgeting um, and then drivers um, like driving tests and whatnot. And they do a lot of hard work too. So we do make that referral and they do reach out. And sometimes when our kiddos don't get back to them, we hear about it and we just really want to promote it and do home visits together and whatnot. So yeah. And bank accounts in school. Morgan is incredible. Sustain Morgan at all costs. She is incredible. I know clone them. I know they're, yeah. I know I love Nick too. Like they're, yeah, they're, yep. Yeah. Yep. So Morgan and Nick are huge. When you have teens in your home, you will be on first name basis with them. You will welcome them into any chaos in your home. You will like, they are the most supportive, non-judgmental. I'm just here. I know your teen is naughty. I know it's not your fault. Like, their, their brains aren't fully formed. We all see that. Like they, they're, that path program is incredible. We love those programs. No, no, no. Yep. Yep. So he asked if you have to be a member of path in order to do that. And then what was your response, Peggy? Yep. So they, it gets referred by the case 14 up and it's referred by your caseworker. So your caseworker will put in the referral to those programs and then they get a hold of you. I think that Morgan's really, really 
packed right now. Once again, we need way more of them. A lot of times. Yeah. 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 So she just said, um, a lot of times they'll refer kids at 14, but a lot of times they won't get in and start getting the program and the services until they're a lot older, like 16, 17, and then they'll really kick in. And a lot of the things that they're working on are those like driver's license, um, job applications, all of those kind of pieces that if you have never navigated before, which can be absolutely, we've bought, we're trying to help Jules buy her first car and I did not know what I was doing inside. So I called Nick and was like, Nick, I know this is not your kid right now, but can you help me find a car or something reasonable? Or what do you know about this? Can you educate me? Not that you guys should all go do that. Cause he'll be really, really, really mad at me, but like they, they are, they're there for all of those, like these teen questions that are like, you're the first time navigating all of these experiences and trying to help your kids through them. And they do a good job of that. Uh, Nick's great at moving apartments too, but for sure don't call him for that either. Nick is going to be like, never let the Wyatts up there ever again. <laughs> yep. Just, I mean, I love working with teens. I'd rather have naughty teens than babies. I love the communication. Um, They might be a little stressful, but they're I think they're great honestly um it can be scary but at the same time like you have to lean on your case manager for questions and if we don't know how to give the answer we lean on our supervisor or our director and the team and I think it's just very rewarding honestly I think something that you always hear is bigger kid bigger issues but I also want to add in there's also bigger solutions so Yep, there's a bigger issue that you're going to come in contact with, but there are bigger solutions. I want to add in 211. We haven't talked about 211 yet. I want to add that in. And even if you have a younger kid, like six or seven, that's really struggling and going through a crisis, we have had super beautiful luck calling 211 and getting their crisis interventionalists. The three that we have in town right now are like top notch. We have really, really, really enjoyed them. It takes some heat off of your caseworkers and your on-call workers because they get on the phone and they're like, um, I don't know anything about this kid. Let me call the caseworker or get back to you in however long. Um, it two on one is it's been beautiful. They will come and sit with your teen that's having a hard time. They will come into your home and take them to get ice cream or take them for a walk or take them and do different. And Zoe can speak to this too. They have been so huge with helping us feel like we don't have to tackle that problem by ourselves. We don't have to find that next solution by ourselves. The only thing we have to do in that moment is call 211 and then they're going to help us. Um, they're supposed to be bridging a lot of the um, law enforcement gaps too. We didn't talk much about law enforcement, but like they're supposed to be helping bridge some of those gaps. Um, I always call law enforcement if something is to the point of like physical aggression. Like if somebody's attacking you, the first call is Law enforcement, second call can be 211 or case manager. Yep. 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 And I would also say, like, when you're dealing with a suicidal teen and they just say they're suicidal and you call law enforcement, they're going to stare at you and be like, I don't know what you want me to do with this right now. So, a lot of times if they haven't actively started doing something or they're not sitting there and you're looking for transplant transport to just know what I say. Yeah. Know what I mean? Not what I say. Um, so if you're looking for like transport, there's, they can help sometimes with that. If you have a teen that's really, really at risk and you can't get to like, um, the ER or something like that. But if you have a teen that's in crisis and is feeling really suicidal and those are still at a feelings level, 211 is that call. You want them, I promise you, you want them there and not a brand new law enforcement officer that stands there like, I have no idea. They'll probably be like, have you called 211? So um, when in doubt, call. I mean, if you are in any way questioning it, call law enforcement and they can get you to the next things and the next steps. But a lot of times 211, unless there is like a really high threat going on. Um, and then social services comes after so I would call 211 initially and then update social services after the fact, unless 
I mean, I would just, I'm sorry if that's the wrong thing to do. Like, yeah. <laughs> I would call 211. Yep. Call on call then afterwards just to update them about what happened, what the 211, what, what came down from that. But calling 211 has been really, really good lately. And we, call, we used to use it like a year and a half ago and it was garbage. Um, so just letting you guys know, they have beefed it up. It is like West Central has great crisis workers right now. And those crisis workers are coming out and have been doing really good crisis work. Do you want to add to that? Cause I feel like you know, do you like the crisis workers? Yeah, I do. They're re they've been really, really helpful with, um, I, there's been quite a few times where we've had to call 211 to ask for help, but you know, we're working on that. Um, and um, I I really really um think that like mom my mom said is it was in the past it wasn't always the best but we've been starting to use it a lot more often now because they've been a lot more helpful. So, but yeah, we're even trying to transition into. I'm not calling two on one whose responsibility, like as your teens are getting older, really trying to hand that over to them and saying, you're in this state right now. What do you probably think you need to do? Cause once they're 18, who's going to need to make the two on one call. It's not going to be me when you're at your friend's house or when you're at your own apartment, it's going to be them. So really trying to transition into that, that adulthood role too, and taking responsibility and doing those things for yourself. Also, when I call, call two on one, it's almost like I'm like, dragging another person into it. And I don't need that where if they can get into that mind frame where it's like, I'm going to go calm down with two on one and get ice cream. You can stay here. It's, it just works out a lot better for everybody involved where they can sometimes get that break. Yeah. I like that. That's a good end. We're not alone. There's a team supporting behind whatever situation you get in as a foster parent, whatever, whatever happens. So can you guys appreciate them for being brave and getting up here this evening and sharing their wisdom? <laughs>